Welcome to Spooky As Shit. I am your host, your still broken host, Eric Dwinnells. And with me tonight, returning favorite, Brian Tony. Hey guys. You go all the way back to episode zero, <laughs> and we're almost at episode 100. Wow. This is 98. It, it, it feels like a short 10 years. Well, it between. is a short 10 years because it's only been two, so... <laughs> All right. Works out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in case you didn't get my reference earlier, I did mention that I was broken. That is because I am. I slipped on some ice and I shattered my ankle. Uh, if you're a basketball fan, it's the same injury and required the same surgery as Gordon Hayward of the Boston Celtics. I Even if you're not a basketball fan, it's still the same injury. That's true. You can you can Google search and uh, see that that game footage six minutes I, into the first. I don't game recommend of the season. it. No, it's don't. <laughs> it's pretty nasty. I've watched it several times myself just because uh. I. To me, actually, p- people are probably most grossed out by when you they pan it to his leg and you can see that his foot is facing the wrong way, and that's what happened to me. I was I, when I went back and watched the footage again, I was like, yeah, that is what happened to me, but. To me, the hardest part of that is the actual incident, like the moment that it happens. And I bet that's not where people usually flinch, but I flinch at that part more than I do when they show the actual injury. Yeah. I mean, there's none of it's great to watch, yeah. so <laughs> guys, you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have You're to. You're welcome but, to. <laughs> but I know the listeners of this podcast, and they <laughs> will like that kind of thing most Macabre of them. Macabre so. sort of taste. All right. Yeah. Um, but the good news is, since last time you heard from me, I have had the surgery... It went well. I just had my stitches taken out the other day, so I'm on the road to recovery. Unfortunately, it's a very long road. Um, can you stop doing that? Oh, you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very long road, and I cannot bear any weight on my left foot for at least another six weeks, and I'm going to be in a cast that whole time. The good news is that it's my left foot, so I can still drive and all that. The bad news is I live on the second floor. So getting up and down the stairs is a bitch, but I'm trying. I'm trying to keep a good positive attitude. Um, There was no episode last week because I just couldn't bring myself around to recording an episode. Um, So there might be other days like that ahead, but I'm glad we're getting this one out. And actually, tomorrow, the day that this should be posted, if I get around to it on time, um, which would be February 18th, that is the actual birthday of the show. Oh. Well, yeah, that's neat. Two years ago, February 18th. So, enough about me and my trials and tribulations. How have you been, Mr. Tony? I've been all right. I just wanted to say, you can say that you are a broken host, but statistically, like, you're way less than 1% broken. Like, it's just a couple of, of parts of you that are broken. I suppose that's true. I'm trying to put a shine on yeah. it for you. <laughs> I told my doctor, well, I work with adults with disabilities, right? Mm -hmm. And he's going to let me go back to work this coming week, which I'm really excited about because I've been cooped in this apartment for four weeks. And it's only a two-room apartment, so it gets pretty boring after a while. But um, I can't go back to full duty, obviously, because I can't put any weight on my legs. I'm going to be in a wheelchair. I'll be behind my desk doing paperwork and running groups at tables and stuff maybe, but not going out in the community and all that kind of stuff like I usually do. Um, But I'll be making money, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, but I told, I was telling my doctor, I was like, yeah, you know, I told my employee to tell the clients at work that, you know, although we're going to be excited to see each other, it's important not to come running up to me and we got to keep a distance and everything. Mm-hmm. Make sure we don't injure the ankle cause it's not a hundred percent healed yet. And the doctor was like, oh, it's not even 10% healed. <laughs> ah, thanks doc. Thanks clinician. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Way to be. All right, so, Brian, uh-huh. before we begin, let me remind everyone about the website, SpookyAS.com or SpookyAssShit.com. They both take you to the same place, and that is the show's blog page. You can listen to each and every episode from there. You can find pictures and videos, sometimes outtakes, although we've gotten pretty professional. <laughs> super, super professional. <laughs> Hardly ever any outtakes to post anymore. Yeah. Uh, you, you could hear the... Super extra special 
audio of me uh, grinding my shoe against the mic stand yeah. just a couple <laughs> minutes ago. That's the sort of stuff we post. You can also find links to our social media. We are at Spooky As Shit on Twitter and Instagram. And you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash spooky as. Boom. All right. Promoted. You ready to get into it? Let's do this, maybe. Now, I know that you love murder. <laughs> Why do you keep... I swear the last episode you said that, too. Well, because I, I know you love like it. This is like a self-fulfilling prophecy at this point. You keep putting me on murder <laughs> episodes. I want to talk to you tonight about a case that I'd never heard about. Uh, I'm already uncomfortable. And it's called The Demon of the Belfry. Uh, okay. Sounds like a second-rate airport book, but... <laughs> well, it, honestly, the murder case isn't... I mean, it's 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 interesting, but there's kind of a, a sequel to it. <laughs> All right. Helping my point. <laughs> That is interesting to me. <clears throat> the demon of the belfry. All right, Brian, this is the story of a man known as William Henry Theodore Durant. Like it? He went by Theodore. We're going to call him Durant. He had a lot of options. Like we're a cop show. <laughs> okay. He was born in 1871 in Toronto in Canada. There's yep. a big myth out there that Canadians are... Very friendly and 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 wouldn't har- harm a fly, and that may or may not be true overall. I thought you were going to say there's a myth out there that Toronto is not in Canada. <laughs> so I just wanted to. All right. Uh, no, no, that's that's been established. Okay. Um, but Canadians they got their fair share of crimes out there too, so don't let them fool you. But uh, he did actually move to California when he was very young just eight years old they moved out to california in 1879 with his family including his sister beulah beulah spell that b-a no b-u-l-a-h that could be wrong i don't know i'm just going off my notes and i write them shorthand so (laughs) fair enough that's very interesting much more interesting than william well, I'm glad that you find her name so captivating. Keep it in mind. Thank you're not you. Gonna, we're not going to talk about her again for a while, but keep it in mind. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so he was doing all right for himself out in California. He grew up and he went to med school in San Francisco. All right. Durant. And he also became the assistant superintendent of the Sunday school of the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Okay. I didn't know that was a position. This must be quite an extensive Sunday school to have a superintendent. Yeah, it's the 1800s too, though. So like, things <laughs> so were whatever. Things were different. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, it, I, I forgot. I forgot that was the 1800s. So yeah. him going to medical school, kind of different thing. Yeah. <laughs> than it is today. All right. I think his family must have been doing okay though, too, because um, we'll learn more about Beulah later on. But she was like going off to study piano in Berlin and everything. So. Oh, that's nice I think for they were her. doing okay for themselves. Uh, but uh, is in his church role, he and you know he he would attend services and everything at the church, so he got to know the congregants and all. And he met a young woman named Blanche Lamont. It's <laughs> not a real name. That's great. It's like a 1920s silent film star. Well, uh, she was 20 years old at the time, and uh, later on, Blanche's sister would say that she did know of Durant because he would show up and he would uh, walk to church with Blanche Mm -hmm. and then he would walk her home at the end of the night. So that's nice. He had kind of designs on this woman, I guess. Yep. Nothing can go wrong here. Now, Blanche had been a school teacher in her hometown, but she moved to California to live with an aunt so that she could continue her own schooling. Okay. College, I guess. Yeah. Everybody's ambitious in this one. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't think you like this part as much. Uh, all right. Thank you. We go now to April 3rd, 1895. Yeah, I hate this already. Anytime there's a specific date, <laughs> you know there's going to be some Something trouble. probably happened yeah. on April 3rd. Nothing happened. <laughs> Next. Durant met Lamont at about 2 p.m. at a trolley stop 
And they got on the trolley together, and other passengers noticed that the pair were sitting very close to each other, and that Durant repeatedly whispered in Blanche's ear, and that he also repeatedly tapped her lightly with his leather-gloved hand. Now, it doesn't get more specific. Okay, but that's already kind of specific. That Why do you pick that out? Right. Well, after the it, fact, you what, pick that out, right? Well, or I don't know. That's that's a good question because there's a lot of things in the story where it's like, well, this Tap. seems to have come out after this yeah. was known. But and like, where was he tapping her? How was he tapping her? Like, what, very innocuous. What did what does this mean? Anyway, that's what they reported. So the witnesses saw them get off the trolley near the church. And there were also witnesses on the street that saw them go into the church together, the Emanuel Church, where he was the assistant superintendent. Now, in the church was a man named George King. He was the church choir director and organist. He's in the church practicing hymns on the church organ, and he either wasn't there when they entered or he didn't see them enter when they did enter. But in any event, he didn't see them at all. Um, but at about 5 p.m., he would report that Durant came down the stairs looking pale and shaken. All right. Durant asked King to run and get him some medicine from a nearby shop. <laughs> you know, just any old kind. <laughs> just medicine. <laughs> That's what it said. I don't know. Was, <laughs> he probably said something, but I... Yeah, I he did go to medical here. school. <laughs> in the 1800s, so he was probably he like, to get oh, medicine. laudanum. <laughs> uh, so after just a few hours later, it's time for the church's evening service. Now, Blanche's aunt comes to the service. And really, she's there looking for Blanche, because now it's been several hours, and she was a little surprised that she hadn't come home. Durant approaches the aunt. And says, hey, where's Blanche? <laughs> Great. And the aunt says, well, I don't know. That's why That's why I'm here. I thought she might be here. Classic. And I'm, I'm a little bit concerned. Yeah. So Durant says that, oh, no, she's not here. She's not here. But um, I'll tell you what. I'm going to uh, come to your house later on <laughs> All right. with a book. <laughs> This guy just deals in archetypes. <laughs> just a book. Well, the Give thing- me a medicine, <laughs> and I will bring a book. <laughs> yeah. The thing about this is, um, it doesn't mention what book. And also, I don't know who the book was supposed to be for. Was he saying, I'm going to bring a book that Blanche wanted to borrow? Or, hey, Blanche is on, I'm going to bring you a book. <laughs> you know, it's just very stream of consciousness. It yeah. has- <laughs> you don't need to know this, but I'm going to have a book with me. <laughs> it's not for you. It'll be there, though. So Durant does appear at the aunt's home, book in hand. (laughs) True to his word. Now, while he's talking to her, he suggests that young Blanche may have been kidnapped and forced into sex slavery. Just drops it. Yeah, just casually. That might have happened. That is quite the thing to say to somebody. Yeah. So the next day, Durant attempted unsuccessfully to pawn some women's rings at a local pawn shop. Okay. I don't know why he was unsuccessful, but in any event, it didn't work. (laughs) Yeah. The same day, Blanche's aunt finds a package. And the package contains... Okay, I thought you were going to stop there. She just found a package. (laughs) And after that... (laughs) She ate some food. Yeah. (laughs) No. She she got a, she found a package, um, and the package contained Blanche's rings. All oh, right. Now there was a re- return address on this package, and the name on the return address was George King. Huh. The choir director. Okay. So after this, the aunt finally reports Blanche missing to the police. She hadn't before because there was no signs to worry about this was a young woman i would have imagined in the 1800s it was a little bit different now if a 20 year old 
goes missing for a night, uh, it's maybe not so concerning. This is the next on the thing? circumstances. Just a day later at this point? Three days. Yeah. It's three days before she reports it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how well she knows her, but like she moved here from someone else, somewhere else. How many people does she even know around here? And one of them is this guy who <laughs> thinks she has been sold into slavery. <laughs> it's a little concerning. Yeah. Seems a little lazy of you, but anyway. So the police were informed that Durant was the last person seen with Blanche. So they obviously wanted to speak to him. Um, but they became even more interested in speaking with him when a female church member reported that she had recently come across Durant sitting naked. <laughs> All right. In now the we're church, getting to it. Sorry. <laughs> in the church library. <laughs> yeah, like you do. People have hobbies. Nothing odd about that. I mean, you're reading about religion. No, no, no. You're reading a book. <laughs> <laughs> no need to get any more specific. Oh, what if that... W- what if it was, like, the book he was jerking off to that he, like, delivered to the aunt? <laughs> I found the greatest book. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll really like it. Oh, brother. Durant denied any connection with the disappearances, and since there was no body and no evidence of foul play, the police just listed Blanche as a missing person, uh, and Durant was free to go. He did not deny being naked in the library? There's no comment on that. Oh. <laughs> Right. On April 12th, another specific day. Uh, go, all right. No, I, nine days in, like it. Yep. Nine days after Blanche's disappearance, 21 year old Minnie Williams told her friends that she was going to a church meeting at the home of one of the church elders, uh, a guy named Vogel. At about 7 p.m., A witness saw Minnie and Durant engaged in a heated discussion in front of the Emanuel Church. Yeah, but was he tapping her? (laughs) Well, the passerby that witnessed this was a man named Hodgkins. And he was concerned enough that he decided to intervene. Okay. Hodgkins would later testify that Durant's manner was, quote, unbecoming of a gentleman. I can't imagine. Naked library guy? (laughs) Less than a gentleman? Uh, But but Durant and Minnie were able to calm down, and Hodgkins watched them walk into the church together. At 9 p.m. that evening, Durant arrives at Elder Vogel's home for the scheduled meeting. Yeah. Minnie Williams, who was told her friends she was leaving to attend that meeting, never shows up does not all right got a pattern the next day some women were decorating the church in prep for easter sunday which would be the following day Mm -hmm. one of the women went to get cups from the closet brian no i have nothing to say about that it's just such a i don't don't know why that struck me (laughs) well here's why because in the closet and don't laugh she There's found the mutilated body. Yeah, nailed it. Of Minnie Williams. Okay. Police suspected that the body of Blanche Lamont would be found in the church too. So they searched and searched. And they didn't find anything, but then they were like, wait, we forgot to check the belfry. So they go up to the belfry, and there they find the nude and badly mutilated body of Blanche Lamont. Yeah, I don't like this. Her head was wedged between two wooden boards. What? And one thing that I read said that she had actually been decapitated. Uh, so I'm not sure what's true as, as far as that goes. Well, but those two statements aren't no, it could be exclusive. It could be true but... that that's what happened. Now, since again he was the last person seen with both women, police immediately wanted to speak with Mr. Durant. He was out of town that day, though. So they forgot about it. No. They found him the next day. He was arrested. Okay. He was arrested on Easter Sunday. And he was eventually charged with both murders. He denied any involvement, and he actually tried to blame it on one of the pastors of the church. 
But rumors began to circulate that he was a sex fiend and that he was a frequent visitor to brothels in the area. Yeah, I mean... Well, here's, here's the rumor about one of those trips, though. Uh, on one of these visits, he was said to have brought a live chicken with him. <laughs> right, now we're going. During the course of the evening, he slit the chicken's throat and let the blood pour over his naked body. Yeah, like a voodoo sort of thing happening? Or am I being insensitive to voodoo? I think I probably am. There is a lot of chicken use in voodoo. I do there know is. that. Yeah. I've seen I've seen like olden days footage of voodoo ceremonies. I don't think this had anything to do with voodoo. I think this was just kind of how he got his kicks, if the story's even true. Because again, this is one of those things that kind of came out as everything was going around being sensationalized. Yeah, the, the Ralph Wiggum testimonial <laughs> that you sometimes find yeah so uh durant denied everything his lawyer said oh he couldn't have done it because there was no blood on him you know the church choir director saw him at five o'clock if he had just come downstairs from committing a murder especially if the woman was decapitated then he would have blood all over him um but the jury and the judge weren't buying it so he was sentenced to death And his sentence was carried out on January 7th, 1898. Oh, okay. So we're we're late 1800s now. Well, we started in 1895. Yeah, no, I I didn't realize that. I'm not sure what that changes. (laughs) Possibly nothing. (laughs) I know. You look so thoughtful, too. Like, oh, well, in that case, that's after the uh, precedenting, precedent-scenting, god damn it, (laughs) (laughs) precedent-setting. Yeah. I'm not even on Oxy anymore. Last last time I <laughs> I was rambling and slurring a bit and I but I was like, well, listen, I'm on Oxy. Yeah. I'm not on my painkillers anymore, just Tylenol. Uh, let's see. So that's really the the end of the story. It's going to say like that's it's strange. It's not even particularly spooky if everything we heard is to be believed. It's just a creepy guy who like got some Got his kicks in weird ways, and also <laughs> saw something in a book, maybe that he, <laughs> nah, whatever. Yes, it's a pretty straightforward yeah. case. Like, there's no mystery about it. There's no. It's almost banal by <laughs> spooky as shit standards. Right. Well, let me tell you this. I told you there was sort of a living sequel to this story. Ooh, we didn't say it was living. Not in the sense of a murder. Yeah. But you remember the sister. I do. Beulah. Good old Beulah. Now, while her brother was out raping and murdering, she was in Berlin. Playing piano. Yes, studying piano. She was very artistic, uh, and she was very passionate about the arts. But she was so traumatized by her brother's crimes and his execution uh, that she quit playing piano. I don't know if the two things are related necessarily, or maybe she just kind of went into a depression over it. But she just couldn't play piano anymore, and she also changed her name. Okay. She went from Beulah to Maud Allen. Eh, downgrade. And instead of being a piano player, she became a dancer. Okay. Now, the thing is, she didn't actually have, like, formal dance training Right. I mean, I imagine I know where this is going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was, was, was there something, um, you might say, exotic about the way she danced? Well, here's the thing. Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, we'll get into it. But uh, she was known to be very athletic and imaginative. And she also designed and sewed her own costumes. Oh, Nice. Just like you. Yeah. I'm not... I mean, I am a trained dancer. I am just was never good at it. Um, so my dancing would be described as imaginative. Yeah. And I can make my own costumes, yeah. Well, there it is. <laughs> now, you asked if she was an exotic dancer. Um, that's a good question, and it's a little bit hard to tell. In so much as such a thing even really existed back then. Yeah. Independent like, of other I mean, there would be like burlesque and that kind yeah. of thing. And it does seem like her dance 
would the dance that we're about to talk about would fall in that category kind of like a burlesque belly dancer ish kind of interpretive dance kind of thing i don't know if she would have seen herself or qualified herself that way yeah but if you look at pictures there are pictures of her online um it does look perhaps a little risque for the times now it's probably something that we wouldn't think twice about but yeah sort of a, a lola montez situation okay yeah so in 1906 she opens her own production of a show that she calls visions of salome in vienna austria all right now like i said this show was considered to be like a risque take on the play salome which was written by Oscar Wilde. Okay. I was going to say, if you're assuming that I know what Salome is, I do not. I'm not super familiar with it either, except that I know it is. Um, it works around religious themes. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is the story of the beheading of John the Baptist. Oh, uh, okay. And also Dance of the Seven Veils is, is in here. All right. Um, and she was known as the Salome dancer because her show was actually a very big hit. Um, nice. But uh, it was a huge hit in Vienna, and it went on to tour England, where she did you know, many performances throughout. But the problem was, this was based on a play by Oscar Wilde. Yeah. If you know, I don't, I don't claim to be an Oscar Wilde expert, but he was a homosexual. Mm-hmm. And in the 1800s, England was not cool with homosexuals. Yeah, in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. And he was imprisoned for two years. That sounds about right. And all of his plays were banned. No. Oh. So just the fact that she was doing something based on an Oscar Wilde play was enough to get people to kind of take a look at her in England and be like, eh, sure, uh, think of the children and such. I don't know about this lady. <laughs> they may have actually said that. Yeah. Also in uh, 1915, she starred in a silent film, The Rug Maker's Daughter. <laughs> That's such a good title for a movie. I'll watch that. You want to know what's up, right? Like, yeah. What about the rug maker's daughter? It's like the rug maker. Well, you know what that is, but there's clearly something about the daughter that is worthy of filming. So let's go. Uh, in 1918, a British magazine called Vigilante published an article with a title that I know you're going to love. <laughs> I can't wait. It was called The Cult of Clitoris. <laughs> That's actually... That's actually less bonkers than I was expecting. Well, it's not bonkers. It's just um, titillating, perhaps. Yeah. Vigilante. I I was getting ready for some shit, but yeah. Well, in this article, uh, the author implied that Maud was actually a lesbian and a German conspirator. Because remember, this was during World War I now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And that she was attempting to turn the men of Britain homosexual. (laughs) Okay. And lead them into sexual degradation. Did they say how? Well, it was with this show. Okay. Salome. And unfortunately, there's not like a video clip of it or anything that I found. (laughs) So I don't know what exactly. I couldn't find the article either. But there's some important background information I would like to give you about the clitoris, Brian. (sighs) Wish you would. (laughs) Someone will finally teach you. Yeah. Now, uh, the clitoris back in these days was, that was like a, a medical term. Yeah. And like Johnny on the street wouldn't necessarily know what the clitoris was. Right. And actually, there around this time, medical ideas start to change, but a lot of doctors still hold old school beliefs. Are we still bloodletting at this point? We're not too far away from it. Okay. But at this time, uh, the doctors, I mean, you know, slightly before this time, it was medically accepted that an enlarged clitoris was a sign of sexual 
um, promiscuity. Okay. And they expected to find enlarged clitoris on lesbians, black women, and nymphomaniacs. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. It was believed that the clitoris was actually basically a small penis, which led to primitive, that's in quotations, uncontrolled sexuality. Uncontrolled? I don't... Like, I don't even know what they thought that meant. What does that well, mean? <laughs> since it was not necessary for reproduction. Yeah. It was sinful to stimulate the clitoris. Ooh, like male nipples? <laughs> okay. And if you did stimulate the clitoris, you would drive a woman crazy. I mean... Or if a woman discovered that her own clitoris and fulfilled herself... It would drive her crazy. And to quote the, the doctors, crazy enough to fuck an elephant. <laughs> All right. All right. There's the bonkers I was looking for. <laughs> we finally got there. Uh, Indian or African? It's not important. <laughs> they didn't specify. All right. Well, maybe next time. So Maud is like, well, listen. This isn't true. I'm not a German conspirator. <laughs> I can't believe I have to say this. <laughs> I do not use my clitoris to turn men homosexual. It's really a roundabout way. I wonder... Well, I was. I don't know if she was uh, categorized, classified. I can't find the right word. But it, she was seen as like a, a sort of very attractive femme fatale type who's in... She's dancing. She's in movies. Um, and her way of turning men gay is to be very attractive. seems like a little counterproductive. But. Yeah. She was a pretty good looking woman. Yeah. I mean, she looks very, there's pictures of her. I'll post them on the website, spookyas.com. But, um, she looks old timey, but you know, it was more, more of the Oscar Wilde thing. I guess that people were pulling one to one comparisons. And I guess so. But anyway, in any event, she decides to sue this magazine for libel. All right. That didn't happen probably all that often back in 1918. No. The article's author, who also happens to be the guy that publishes the magazine, he like owns Vigilante Magazine, uh, he claims that he purposely chose the title Cult of Clitoris because he knew that most people would not know what a clitoris was. So, by the very fact that she is offended at being named in this article... It proves that she does know what a clitoris is. If she knows what a clitoris is and she's not a medical professional, that means she's a fucking pervert. <laughs> okay. Uh, top to bottom. People are cool. Uh, what, so when you say most people don't know what the, what the clitoris is, like you're saying that most women don't... They're just like, oh, there's this well... thing here... Here's the is thing. it sort of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge situation? Let's just not talk about it. I don't know exactly, <sighs> but the but according to Wikipedia, actually that's not where I found this. This was on a different website. I'll try to post a link. But, Wikipedia. But the um the the writer says that he asked some forty men <laughs> oh, if they knew oh. what a clitoris was, and out of those forty men, only one of them did. Shocked. But he asked all dudes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. Which, listen. No other questions. It's not saying much for the men of England either, I'm, I'm afraid. No, nope, no. Nope. Not great. Clitoris? What? <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> and the one who did know what it was is like, I know what that is. It's a myth. <laughs> Just like the female orgasm. During the libel trial, her brother's crimes were brought up. Mm, and it's too bad. the prosecution says, look. Her brother was a sexual maniac who raped and murdered women. This is proof that sexual insanity runs in her family. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, there was no way for her to block all this. By the way, Maude was kind of a badass because she represented herself in trial. Well, I mean, you can say that's badass or possibly just a really bad idea if she wasn't good at it. It is both. Okay. <laughs> It is badass and a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, because actually, the magazine was acquitted. 
Yeah. So it didn't really help her to have this trial. Um, but she then moved back to California and she opened her own dance studio where she taught people how to dance. And she lived with her secretary and lover, Verna Aldrich. Verna Aldridge. Nice. All right. She died in 1956. Okay. And that's the end of the story of the Durant family. But I thought it was interesting how the sins of the brother affect the life of the sister later on. Decades later. Yes. Yep. Well. Did it get more interesting enough for you? It, it did. I, I, the second half is is at least much more different than the... It's a little less by the nice. numbers. Yeah. Well, she sounds like a a hip hip lady, to borrow a phrase from, <laughs> from Dazed and Confused. That's a good movie. It is. Well, I she, feel so, like... she sounds all right, and I I kept waiting for her to be imprisoned or like murdered or something because that's still not out of the realm of, of possibility in like the twenties and thirties. Like, <laughs> I, I yeah. So I'm glad that didn't happen. I would be interested to know what she was like. I wonder if there's any interviews or anything with her out there. I bet not. It's probably not. None of the stuff is probably anything she ever really wanted to talk about. But it'd be interesting. I'm going to try to find that movie. The Rug Maker's Daughter. <laughs> the Rug Maker's Daughter. And then shoot a shot for shot remake of it. Yeah. With puppets. You can find it like. So I didn't look too hard, but what I found online so far is only. Like the names of the people who were in it. That's it. All right. But I'll keep looking and see if I can find a poster or maybe even a little clip. It was a silent movie. Yeah. A very early movie. 1915, did I say? I think. I don't know. So that's very early on. Yeah. I bet it's unwatchable. <laughs> if I'm being perfectly honest, it's probably insanely boring. Because that early, they're just getting used to the fact that, hey, look. These are people moving around and you can see them and you can like put this in your car and take it with you and watch it later. I mean, not you personally. <laughs> I was going to say. If I you carry around this enormous projector <laughs> and a couple of huge reels. <laughs> but just getting used to the idea of the medium. And so storytelling, I'm guessing, was a distant second behind, hey, look at this cool thing. Yeah. All right, then. That's episode 100. No, that's <laughs> episode 90. No, I'm saying that's, that's what we're doing for episode oh. 100. Watching the rug maker's daughter. <laughs> we'll release a commentary track. <laughs> After smoking PCP. Oh. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once again, I want to remind you about the website, SpookyAS.com. Find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash SpookyAS. I can't thank you enough for listening to the show and spreading the love for the show and sharing it with friends and loved ones and of course if you could write a nice review on itunes um, there's a link on the web page if you don't know how to get there there's a link on the web page you just click on that uh it's every episode it's listed you're going to see listen to the episode find us on facebook write a review on itunes those are all linked right on the top of every episode post so you can just click through there leave us a wonderful five star review if you have any comments or concerns about the show, you can email me at spookyassshit at gmail.com. And I would really appreciate it. It would make me feel much better. Come on, I've got a broken ankle. I'm sitting here in a cast, a black cast, black like my soul. All right. Didn't know where you were going with that, but there it is. What? <laughs> black like your soul? Yeah. Okay. James Brown. This keeps going different places. All right. All right. Anyway, until next time, don't be afraid.